were the plays dastardly this time around? Well, they certainly were, starting with Ben Holbrook and Nate Wida's The Dastardly Thorns versus The Town of Goldhaven, which takes the lawless cowboy story and turns it on its rear. In order to get justice, the mayor of the town of Goldhaven, Baron Golden Teeth, and Ma Brown have gotten dim-witted Willie Fish to bring in Lester Thorne, head of the Dastardly Thorns, to the Atavarian Theater, run by Hummingbird, to reenact the proceedings that led up to the bloody gunfight that left half the town dead. It's being sponsored by Steakhouse with his successful beans. It all started bucolically with Jimmy Thorne and Mar Mac Brown as best friends who got into a heap of trouble. Everything changed when Mac was appointed sheriff by the mayor. He was now the law, an enemy of Jimmy and his clan. Friendship, White Wing Dove, Crackle, and Roadrunner are family members on both sides were caught in the middle. There were many sides to this bloody shootout, including hearing from the animals that witnessed the whole enterprise. The upshot was that no matter who was blamed as a villain, everyone's loved one ended up dead. It was up to you to decide who or what you want to blame for the tragic story. Along the way, you are going to get a damn fine musical with the sweetest singing, bodacious costume, high kicks, and side-splitting maneuvers that will leave you breathless with laughter and admiration. I love this. It's at the brink. It's so intimate. They're in your lap, practically. I give this a major, 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 major happy face. Rock and Roll Man is a new original off-Broadway musical and New World Stages. It tells the story of Alan Freed, the man credited with coining the phrase rock and roll. Freed introduced music from Black artists to white audiences by giving them airplay as a disc jockey on the radio. This was seen as revolutionary and helped break down racial barriers. Given the spread and cultural phenomenon that rock and roll became, Freed was viewed as disruptive and chaotic to social order. Ultimately, his career was brought down by a payola scandal. This was a story that I was not familiar with and one that left me curious to learn more about the protagonist. It took me back to my days as a college radio disc jockey as well. And as a huge fan of Beatles and classic rock music, it was great to see the impact on this genre. Being that this is a show that takes the story of one individual in the music scene, this bio script format felt very similar to Beautiful, A Beautiful Noise, Jersey Boys, and you know, many others that we have come to know and see on the stage. While this comes across as a tired format, the show is still able to hold its own, and it differs being that its subject is not a musician, rather one who had an influence on the music scene. The show was filled with great musical numbers featuring songs from artists spanning the 50s and included original music by Gary Cupper. Familiar tunes such as Yakety Yak and rock and roll music can be heard. I was a big fan of the choreography, and having dresses twirl across the stage. The show took place in the 50s, so costumes and wigs were visually captivating and helped set the period. The set featured great attention to detail, including records in the background of many scenes, and those records would actually change. So early on, they would be Fat Domino and Lil Richard, and later they became Lord and Pink Floyd. So it highlighted the influence that Freed had, even on the present day music landscape. I found the premise of the show taking place through a dream that Freed was having in the trial of public opinion to be a little strange and difficult to follow. It had J. Edgar Hoover prosecuting, who was not in real life the prosecutor. Uh, and so it was hard to tell reality from hallucination. Uh, but overall, I give it a happy face. It was an interesting story that I was unaware of before. Irish Rappers presenting The Savior by Deidre Kinahan and directed by Louise Lowe. It concerns an elderly woman named Mare who addresses at the beginning of the play a very long monologue to Jesus, where she's very thankful that um, her friend that she met through church, uh, Martin, uh, who's a bit younger than she is, uh, is having sex with her. And she actually enjoys it, which seems to be different from her marriage. 
he's um, wondering about Martin that, you know, she thinks he's a good man who's repented his sins, but later in the day, and it's her birthday, her adult son, Mel comes to give her a gift, which is a baby doll kind of thing, really infantilizing his mother, refusing to believe that she's an adult sexual being. And he's very down on Martin. He's found out some information about Martin's sordid past and criminal activity, which could put their grandchildren in danger. So um, it's really about um, what can Jesus forgive uh, and what can't he forgive? What can Mayor accept and what can't she? Because she really can't accept her son's lifestyle. I thought it was very good. It raised a lot more questions than it could answer, but in a very interesting way with the usual superlative acting that's always something from Ira Threll. This is definitely merits a happy face. I saw the Room of Falsehood at uh, C. Mark's Place Theater uh, underneath the Fun Times Tattoo Parlor on C. Mark's Place in the Lower East Side last night. The <clears throat> plot of the Room of Falsehood is based on the cult classic The Room, which is a, an obscure indie movie from the 1990s. And the plot is a series of misadventures where the lead uh, has to track down who is uh, having an affair with his girlfriend, who's also his fiance. And they have a series of misadventures within uh, the narrative. The original movie was slapdash and ridiculous in its plot. There's they the the original movie used a lot of cliches it was the the whole original movie the room was a series of uh camp liners and and kitsch ideas of uh who's who's having sex with my fiance um and they delivered it way too seriously so it became a cult classic based on, on this nonsense um it's also english in a second language so everyone in the, the original movie had basically word salad in order to uh, say their lines, which they said in the most uh, pretentious, uh, believing uh, garbage. They all believed in their lines a little bit too much. Um, and so this, this terrible movie became a cult classic because it was so bad. And so New York City theater, not to be outdone, went ahead and, and made a remake of The Room using Shakespearean language and an all-women cast. Um, and so this was a really, really wild idea and a wacky play. I give it a mixed face plus because this is inside theater. They're doing a camp remake of a kitsch classic that would only be interesting to people who really loved that original movie because it was so bad. So this is the best of the best of insider theory, theater, but I can't recommend it to anybody except for a theater or film geek, such as myself and yourself, uh, that's whoever's watching this and the rest of my team. So definitely Mixed Face Plus, but they did a great job and it's a great, this is this is the, the height of experimental theater because, you know, it doesn't get any more weird and, um, definitely the weirdest thing I've ever seen. And I want to support these guys in that for the rest of you, please don't see this. This is terrible, but you know, it's uh, yeah. if, if you are a theater nut, like the rest of us, you should absolutely see this because they're doing some really cool stuff. Mixed face plus. Inwa Elams, a British Nigerian playwright has a new play at the New York theater workshop, which is called half God of rainfall. It's a very ambitious project. It's an epic poem which deals with mythology and the Greek gods and all the other deities and, and with the Nigerian folks. It's directed in the form of storytelling addressed directly to the audience. The god Zeus who rapes a Nigerian woman named Nodupa, Jennifer Mogbok, 
who gets give birth to a son who's half God and becomes a superstar basketball player. The following play is full of sound and fury about this mythic tale. Demi, the son, has magical powers. He's uh, the actor's name is Fitzgerald, Mister Mr. Fitzgerald. Fitzgerald. The demigod, when he cries, he can have rainfall and other powerful incidents. The cast is of seven, made of seven actors, very strong and loud, expressing their rage. Most powerful is Oson, played by Patrice Johnson Chivan. She's fantastic. The lighting design, Stacy de Rossier, and the sound by Mikhail Suleiman, most effective. But the feel of the play, the deeper sensations do not reach the heart. The play is far too long for this kind of present presentational style, but the poetry is great. Sadly, I could not relate too much with the play, though virtually it was stunning. Mixed face. Yeah, I, I agree. First of all, it took me forever to even focus on the play. I was like, they were like talking and talking, but their words were not putting any meaning or story you know it didn't really get exciting to me till some action took place and also for me with vertigo there's a lot i mean there was this constant moving clouds and rains and shifting things projections and light flashing so a lot of times i was just listening to it rather than watching it but i mean it had moments to me where it, it came together and I was like drawn into the story, but mostly you're kept at arm's length because it was so presentational and also it was so confusing with all the Greek God elements and who was who and the Nigerian elements and, and all that was very confusing. But, but basically it's about women taking back power from powerful men like Zeus. Zeus just felt he could, he, he, it goes on, uh, the whole Greek mythology of him turning himself into animals and constantly raping women all over the place and fathering all these children like Hercules, you know, and, and how, you know, enough is enough and found, you know, it, it it's just very powerful how you try to, you know, subdue all that. And then there was the whole basketball element, which I found interesting because next I'm going to be talking about another basketball play I saw. Yeah, well, that is very thing I did not find interesting that from Greek Greek mythology or going to the basketball. I'm not, I'm a basketball fan, but I did not relate to it. I think the problem with these kind of works is the playwright is very powerful. He's like, <clears throat> he knows everything about Greek mythology, but a lot of people who are watching, they do not really know. Okay. So second thing is we we have through the words you know the words without thoughts do not to have and go it has to have a feel the feeling of the word is not coming across to us we're just there and visual effects are fabulous because rain falls it's a money kind of project because you cannot just do it simply and the but, costumes by linda cho are really good too. yeah they're very good but you see that these kind of things have to be done expressed very simply so the audience can understand. Some people do not know. When they come to the theater, they have to learn something from the play and feel something. And that was missing. I agree. So I'm giving it a mixed as well. And up kind of Lincoln Center, there's another basketball play. Candace Jones Flex is an offensive basketball maneuver that serves up as a metaphor for achieving goals through fair means or foul. Star Jones is captain and point guard of the Lady Trains, this ragtag female basketball team in 1998, Plano, Arkansas. Stara, whose mother was a star basketball player, has handed down all her dirty tricks for her daughter to get ahead where she didn't. Stara faces fierce competition from Sydney, who has come from California, which the other team players tease her about. Stara's cousin Cherise has just become a youth minister and desperately wants the team to get baptized. She feels closest to Donna and wishes Stara would come clean about her bad behavior. The team is there for April, who is in a very difficult situation that might derail her basketball dreams. The coach has strict rules that apply even if it will cost them a state championship. Will the team be able to resolve their individual issues and pull together to board and win, to bond and win? Or are some actions too unforgivable or unfixable? The driven acting lent an urgency that pulled you into this all or nothing struggle to succeed at all costs. And I give this one a happy face. It's a slam dunk. 
Hi, here we are with Steve Jones, who's written a play called Rooms for Rent. And this is your first play. So what inspired you? What made you decide to write this play? Tell us about this play, because I'm not going to get to see it till August 14th or 15th. So I don't know anything about it. Okay. Um, well, the play is about six women from different backgrounds. They're all going to rent rooms in the same apartment. And it's just, you know, it's, it's comedic. It's about their interactions from all their different backgrounds. Different people have different stereotypes about others. And uh, it's about like this melting pot apartment with six different women coming in. And, uh, you know, it just shows that they all, they start out strangers and then they end up kind of finding common ground amongst each other as women. And uh, in the end, they like become best friends and certain things are worked out. You know, we touch on a lot of different subjects. Uh, we touch on like uh, 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 domestic violence, um, uh, suicide, uh, you know, abortion, um, LGBT. Hmm? Fun subjects. Yeah. Yeah, uh, LGBTQ plus uh, issues, you know, we have a variety of different people and, and, you know, uh, from different backgrounds and, you know, different sexualities, you know, the whole thing. So it's, it's just about bringing them all together in kind of a funny way. But we also touch on a lot of serious subjects also. Um, I don't know, it's just something that came to me. Uh, I used to manage a playwright uh, for a couple of years uh, by the name of uh, by the name of Ann Thompson Scratching. Uh, I managed her, and from managing her, I kind of got bit by the bug and uh, started writing myself. You know, I was in the in the theater with her, and uh, we were we were putting sets together, uh, auditioning actors, the whole thing. And I just kind of got caught. And a couple of years later, I ended up writing my own play uh, and, you know, kind of feeling like, hey, maybe I can I can do a better job or, you know, throw my hat in the ring and, 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 and see how it, how it will work. Just watching other other people do it. I just kind of got caught and, um, you know, it, it's been going good. We've been rehearsing for, for quite a while. We're gonna do this preview uh, August 14th and 15th at the American Theater of Actors on uh, 314 West 54th Street, uh, fourth floor. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna be there just for previews, and then we'll see you know if we can find a theater home after that. Um, talking to a few places now, but the preview is is a great place to uh, you know work out all the kinks. And, and go through the show and you know we, we're inviting people down to come and see the preview and from there we'll we'll roll it out you know uh full stop with everything with all the bells and whistles but for now we're just gonna you know we're gonna go with the preview so you're kind of dipping your toe in the water and it kind of sounds like big sisters instead of big brothers yeah yeah it is it is it's it's very interesting. Uh, it was interesting for me to write uh, for so many different ladies, six different people just interacting with one another, how this one feels. I had to get in everybody's head, every character's head, and write from their perspective. So it, it was a task, but I don't know. It's just something that came to me. And, uh, you know, I have more plays uh, to go. I have about three or four more plays, ideas, and uh, about four or five short films that are coming up also. We're going to shoot a film, a uh, short film this summer, and then we'll see how that goes. So I like to kind of start out uh, just trying it out, dipping my foot in. I'm not going to do a full feature film. I'm going to do short film, see how that goes. Then we'll maybe roll it out to a full feature film. But, uh, you know, short film is like up to 40 minutes. And, you know, I think that's good enough for starters. And it's going to be some comedy there, too. It sounds wonderful. So yeah. um, hopefully if I can, someone else from my group can see it. But thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. You, may, you bring this to our attention. Great. Thanks good for luck. having me. Yeah, just let me know. And uh, 
we'll get them on the list and you know they can come right down see the show so today we are going to be talking about Eisenhower, this piece of ground, Richard by Richard Hellazen and starring John Rubenstein. It's playing over at St. Clement's on the far west side, and it is basically a one, brilliant one-man play about Eisenhower's post-presidential years. He was in the process of writing another book when the New York Times came out with this listing of the presidents in order. And he was horrified to find out that he was not in the top tier, that he was below a number of what we would consider today inconsequential presidents. And because Eisenhower was notably possessed of a temper, he mm -hmm. promptly went on this extended rant that was caught on tape recorder to send to his publisher. And it is absolutely brilliant. I mean, he basically talks about his growing up years, his parents, the kind of preparation that they gave him when he was a kid to go to West Point and basically become the leader of World War II for both the European and the Pacific theater of operations. He talks about his presidential years. He talks about a lot of stuff that I did not know he was, Eisenhower was responsible for, like a lot of civil rights issues and uh you know helping to integrate the army so it was a very informative play rubenstein was brilliant uh and what i really liked was the background is this ever-changing panorama it takes place in the living room of his of his farm at gettysburg but behind him is this giant picture window that shows mountains and a green field and then a thunderstorm comes up and rolls by and then it's raining and then it's sunny again. By Joe Huppert. Okay, Joe Huppert. And uh, every now and then Mamie calls because she's in town getting the car fixed. But it, it really is a wonderful, wonderful performance. And the scenic design is by Michael Deegan, who is incredible. And the thing is, to me, what I love about uh, Eisenhower is, you know, my dad was a, a captain in World War II, so he had a picture in his office of Eisenhower. So I always just think of Eisenhower as his photograph on the wall. And my friend Carrie in England was married, and she was. we were riding around in this white limousine that was used by Eisenhower. So I kind of had this personal connection to Eisenhower, so I've always been fascinated by him. Plus, his vice president was my hero, Nixon, who wrote that famous checker speech during his reign. And the thing is, we can always Google and find out about a president, but to see him after that is even more interesting. After such a lofty position, how does one settle down to a normal, quiet existence without any control of several men in battle or battling Congress to get fair laws passed? This is not some dusty history lesson, but a vibrant look at the remarkable man. And I'm giving this a happy face plus because I just thought this was and John Rubenstein, he's come a long way from Pippin. He is a really phenomenal actor. Well, I didn't know that much about Eisenhower because my father, who was also a World War II vet, loathed the man. He couldn't stand him. I don't, I don't know what his reasons were, and it's no longer around for me to ask. No, my father was was a General Patton man because he was tied to Patton's army. So I grew up learning all about Patton, which is why I knew nothing about Eisenhower, even though I'm also a, a huge fan of World War II military history. But I have actually done a lot of research on Eisenhower since seeing this play, which is another good thing that it did. It basically opened my eyes to a part of history that I did not know about. So I too give this a happy face plus. It's been extended through August 20th. The audience, it was a sellout crowd when we were there. Um, so go see it. Okay, our next show is going to be August 26th. And this is closing on August 13th, but I didn't have time to get it in before the deadline. It's at Second Stage Uptown. It's called Toros, and it's written by Danny Tejera, directed by Gail Taylor Upchurch, and it's got Frank Woods in it. It's apparently about these three international late 20-somethings and one dying golden retriever that hang out in a garage in Madrid. They smoke, pitis, get drunk, argue about the music, and figure out what version of reality to believe in. 
So I'm seeing it on August 6th. So the review should be in right now. Anyway, going on at 5090's 59th Street Theater, our favorite theater, we still have Prejudice and Pride, which we're going to see, and a eulogy for Roman. And Borderless is going on at Theater Lab until August 20th. And the International Puppet Fringe Festival, you've got till this weekend to see it. I'm going to go see Sapienta on August 13th. And also on August 13th, at the Queen's Flushing Town Hall, you've got the Taiwanese Puppet, which brings theater with its award-winning performance of pep, 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 Paper Play. Ugh. And Mark Sabat, he reviewed Primera Sueno from Repertorio Espanol, but that closed August 6th. And Metropolitan Playhouse, not only is New Ohio Theater where we've been seeing, where Jake has been seeing Ice Factory lately, it's closing its doors forever, but Metropolitan Playhouse is ending its 27 year run on August 17th with a farewell party. I will never get to cross off my bucket list to be Lionel Barrymore in It's a Wonderful Life. I'm heartbroken. I love that place. It's like the Mint Theater. They do these old, old plays from the 1900s that dust them off and bring them to us. And he also has this East Village Chronicles to talk about the neighborhood the theater's in. I, I was going to leave such a hole in our, our theatrical fabric. Anyway, talking about East Village, we've got Joe's Pub. And they've been doing wonderful things lately. I went to see NAMP, National Alliance of Musical Theater. I didn't have to wait till October. They had a little summer sneak preview. And uh, coming up till August 10th, I'll be talking about Jeff Heller, whom I just, he just cracks me up. And you know, we just love 54 Below. And the Negro Ensemble Company is premiering Mecca is Burning, which is a composite play at Harlem School of the Arts. And that's going on to August 20th. And the Little Shakespeare Festival is going on to August 19th at Under St. Mark's. And I think that what Jake was talking about, the room under falsehood is part of that event. I, in fact, I know it is. So, so it looks like this kind of fringy, kitschy, amusing, serious stuff going on there. So lots going on, and we will see you on my birthday, August 26th.